Engineered Air Balance is a leading authority in total system balancing and building commissioning at the forefront of industry standards and training. Our state-of-the-art training center is located in Houston, Texas. It is here where we are uniquely equipped to train the next generation of technicians. We are committed to developing and teaching technical knowledge, expertise, and the problem-solving skills needed to move the entire industry forward. Please subscribe and follow our channels. If you would like more information on the Engineered Air Balance Training Facility or training materials, please contact training at eabcoinc.com. Hello, everyone. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on what time zone you're dialing in from, and welcome to another AABC Tab Talk webinar. My name is Sam Schwartz and I'll be your moderator today. I'm going to go over just a few housekeeping notes before we get into things. We encourage you to submit questions at any time using that Q&A button, but we'll be holding the Q&A session until the end of the presentation, but please don't hesitate to send them in as they come up. The chat function is where you can make general comments and chat with attendees. If you happen to to be experiencing any technical issues during the webinar, please use the chat function to inform the panelists and we will assist you. And then finally, this course has been approved for one hour of continuing education credit. So after the webinar, you will receive an automated email with your proof of attendance. And today we are going to be talking about electrical safety basics, arc flash and shock hazards with Terry Becker, who's joining us. He is an electrical safety pioneer and innovator in Canada. He has over 31 years of experience in the electrical engineering and consulting and large corporations and over 15 years of experience directly related to electrical safety consulting. He is the founding voter mem voting member, a uh, first past chair of the CSA Z462 Workplace Electrical Safety Technical Committee, um, the CSA C463 voting member, and an IEE 1584 voting member. So without taking up any more precious time today, I'm going to hand it off to Terry, who's going to kick it off, kick it off for us. Terry? Thanks, Sam. And I just want to, again, welcome everybody this afternoon. And I also want to thank uh, ABC for bringing me in to do this webinar. So electrical safety basics, arc flash and shock, that's what we'll be covering today. Uh, again, some additional background information on me, which I'll just leave for you to review uh, offline uh, when you're reviewing the video or uh, if you do have access to the PowerPoint. But as Sam said, I am uh, an electrical safety subject matter expert. I've immersed myself myself in the applicable standards in both Canada and US. And today the presentation will actually be addressing, again, electrical safety basics in the context of uh, business in Canada and the US with the reference to applicable standards. So here's our agenda plan uh, for the next hour or so. So again, electrical safety basics. So electrical has identification, just to revisit that, but I do have some new information that I'll be presenting with respect to electric shock. Again, just uh, reiterating again the role of OSHA in the US or OHS regulations in Canada. Uh, I'm going to talk about electrical incident statistics just briefly to sort of frame these two hazards and put them into the context that I, I tend to do. Then I will be talking about the industry accepted best practice standards, uh, NFPA 70E uh, for the US and CSA Z462 for Canada. They continue to evolve. Uh, both were published in two, 2021 editions. And uh, we've got 2024 editions coming soon. I will just briefly highlight the key requirements, uh, framing it around the 2021 edition of those standards. And that'll set the context again for how we're using these standards to do electrical hazard identification and risk assessment. And I will talk about at a high level risk assessment as well. I will just at the end um, have some slides to review the arc flash and shock PP. Um, and again, emphasize some requirements there on sort of the minimum arc flash PP or what I call a level one, and then some closing remarks to uh, close us off. And then the Q&A session that Sam mentioned. So again, welcome and appreciate your time today. So there's two identified electrical hazards, electric shock. And again, that one, uh, well, again, relatively easy uh, to interpret when it's all, I'll go through when you're exposed, but neglected. 
right? So electric shock hazards have been accepted in the workplace by workers that are exposed. They, they've been shocked. They haven't reported it. Um, it's only reported if it turns out to be an electrocution because that would be a fatal injury. I'm going to talk about something new that you probably haven't heard about until today, which is potential long-term effects of receiving an electric shock or multiple electrical shocks called sequela or sequelae. So I'll have some slides on that. The arc flash hazard, lots of stuff out there on arc flash, and, and I'm telling you it continues to evolve in its growing personality, right? So I'm going to try and make some comments today to distill some of the misinterpretation of when a worker is exposed to arc flash. Again, it's voltage dependent, so that's really important that uh, if we have a worker that is doing energized electrical work tasks, it's what the work task description is and what's the maximum nominal voltage of that electrical equipment so that we can determine if we can sustain an abnormal arcing fault that becomes an arc flash. After that, we need to have some information about available fault current and that the worker is working under an electrical protective device that would see the abnormal arcing fault and open to minimize the incident energy or the heat that's released from an arc flash. So we'll go through that. The primary injury is the burn injury, but there are other um, secondary effects of being exposed to an arc flash. So I always talk about, you know, okay, how, when's a worker exposed? And that's what we need to talk about. I've got these worker roles in my company. They do these work tasks based on jobs and the jobs are basically to solve a problem. The electrical equipment's not running, right? We need to troubleshoot it or we need to isolate it. So it starts with the worker role, the job that they're going to complete, and coming up with a work task inventory. And I frame it around what I call an energized electrical job workflow. And it's simply everything that you have your workers doing today on either maintenance and or construction sites, jobs assigned, work task inventory, all workplace hazards will be identified, but specifically I'm focusing on electric shock and arc flash. All right, so identify when you're exposed. I've got a note there that arc blast pressure, I'll talk about that briefly, that arc blast pressure has been perceived to be extremely high pressure. That's also not true. Um, so that that continues to be communicated by me and others, but we also see some improved information generically coming to industry that arc blast pressure is not going to be extremely high in most cases. And again, if you're electrocuted, you didn't, recive, you didn't survive the electric shock. And we'll talk about again, that the unique shock risk assessment and arc flash risk assessment um, procedures that are in NFPA 70 and Z462 to determine additional protective measures, uh, which is the PP tools and equipment you need and the boundaries. So the shock protection approach boundaries, the arc flash boundary and other practices and, and procedural, excuse me, procedural requirements you'll need to, uh, to use again to reduce risk. So I've got this job workflow. It's a visual tool. I use it all the time because this is how we need to manage these hazards. What's the worker role? What job are they performing? Do work task has identification? Is there a procedure? And do they need to follow procedure? Is there some you know, employer field level hazard assessment document? And then 70E and Z462 kick in on the remaining steps. We need an energized electrical job safety plan and a form should be filled out. And then the worker identifies their risk control methods they're going to apply to achieve an acceptable residual risk. And then they go into the field and apply them. Establish an electrical work zone barricading to control the work area. Keep unqualified, unprotected workers out, right? And then please inspect the PP, don it, execute the work task, doff the PP, close out the work order. So I've just zoomed in on those steps. I'll just let that be on the screen for a few seconds. But this is how I sort of frame this on the left and right-hand side. We talk about some of the 70E Z462 requirements, an energized electrical work permit, which is also confused. Um, you do not need the permit for most work tasks it's exempted, right? Related to risk, we want to make sure we've got a qualified and competent worker and we put specific focus on human performance and unfortunately the likelihood of the worker, you know, and, and making human error, making a mistake, all right? And it's all work task based. You'll see that more as I go through the, the webinar today that it's start with work tasks. It is completely aligns with NFPA 70E and CSA Z462, which are currently Technically harmonized, but we're seeing some divergence in 70E and Z462 um, starting in the 2021 edition. And you're probably going to see a, a lot more divergence in the 2024 editions of, of CSA Z462 and 70E. And then remaining of the workflow, like I said, once the worker gets these controls, they got to field apply them. And again, we want them to formally set up a work zone and, and, and pre-use check that PP. It's critical they pre-use check the electric shock PP, specifically the rubber insulating gloves and leather protectors. 
and the ERP Flash PP that, that they've determined that they need that the employer obviously will support and assist them with, with respect to the provision of the PP. And 70E and Z462 provide us, again, a toolbox of where we can get the information on, on what this PP is that the employer might and probably does need to procure uh, to provide to their workers. So identify specifically when a worker is exposed to electric shock. It starts with the work task again. And will there be exposed conductors and circuit parts with voltage present? And again, the most common method of exposure is that there is exposed conductors and the workers going in with their hands. They're going with their hands with a test instrument, right? So they're going with their hands with a test instrument. And we're going to use the definitions of low voltage from the National Electrical Code or the Canadian Electrical Code. Uh, less than or equal to 1,000 volts is low voltage. A greater than or equal to 1,001 volts is high voltage. The C Code Part 1 in Canada, the 2021 edition, changed to these definitions of low and high voltage. So are we working in proximity to overhead conductors and circuit parts, you know, distribution lines, you know, inside substations? Again, this is a, an all-worker topic for electric shock. Inadvertent movement risk or direct contact. And so for the low voltage, again, it's your hands going in with these test instruments, right, into those conductors with these probes. And that's been one of the problems, bare hands going in, inadvertent movement, momentary contact, momentary current flow into the body, pain, worker flinches out, and then they don't report that shock. That's sort of been the norm, all right? Burying, I'm sorry, digging, so exposing uh, energized cables. And lastly, we cannot neglect using portable cord and plug connected electrical equipment and extension cords. And the worker needs to understand you know, the maximum volts of exposure. And it really starts with nominal 120 volt AC single phase. And for DC, and again, the DC is still sort of evolving for electric shock and arc flash, but it's greater than or equal to 125 volts DC UPS battery output or significant DC power source. All right, so work task description, expecting exposed conductors and circuit parts, what's the voltage, and then you would complete a shock risk assessment. So I've got some pictures here because I have to do this every time. You know, we need to manage portable cord and plug connected electrical equipment for its condition. And, and electrician's tape is not allowed to be used by any worker other than really an electrician, right? But forever, you're going to see this on job sites. The worker damages it. They have tape. They tape it up. So they need to basically tag it and bag it, give it to the supervisor and, and be provided a new one. And then an electrician would repair it if they can and put it back into service. So I've just got I emphasize this all the time. We've got to make sure we manage that. So the definition of a shock hazard, and this is right out of 70E and Z462, a source of possible injury or damage to health associated with current through the body caused by contact with or approach to energized conductors and circuit parts, right? So that's it. You got to make contact with, with a low voltage. You got to contact it. But for high voltage overhead systems, distribution lines, substations, switch yards, you know, you don't have to necessarily make contact. You get too close. The voltage is high enough. It'll arc through the air and it'll go through you to ground and, and cause a shock. Well, it'll probably be an electrocution at those high voltages pretty well instantly. So the, the effects are listed on the left. This is sort of a standard table from the electrical safety handbook. And then for heart fibrillation, right? You know, Dr. C.F. Delziel back in 1954 was doing the research. So for heart um, fibrillation, we need a current to go through your heart for a certain amount of time. And then your heart can go into fibrillation. You gotta be defibbed, right? So Again, the short-term effects on the left, and one of those might be that your heart goes in defibrillation, and if we don't get your heart defibbed, then you could be electrocuted within roughly six minutes. It's lack of oxygen to the brain, in that case, uh, is the electrocution. Now, I mentioned that there's some new information on electric shock. I didn't know about this. I had communicated it, but not regularly. Recently, I've had an electrician approach me and said, Terry, you've talked about long-term effects of electric shock. I said, yes, I said, but no one's really come forward. So he did, and now I am including it in my presentations, in my training, that sequela is a potential real, it is, it's real, right? So if you have been shocked multiple times and you're aging, which we do, then you think that you're having problems due to aging or you know other problems. It may be that those problems are related to the electric shocks that you've received one or multiple over the time frame of your career, right? So. This is a secondary effect. I'm just going to paraphrase that. It's a secondary effect of a primary hazard exposure. So current flows into our body. And what's happening is it's affecting us at the nervous system. That's why we feel pain. But the research indicates that it's affecting us at the cellular level. All right. So, and, and, and I'm just going to emphasize that there's this article 
that's published in the Canadian Family Physician a magazine. You can search for it and actually download it, right? But it's probably one of the most uh, simple documents that talks about it and frames it, right? And then on the right are a list of over 30 potential, right, long-term sequelae, right, related to electric shock, right? Physiological, neurological, or physical, right? So no, no, not, no notoriety, no awareness, no communication. But this has been known for over a decade. And the problem is, if the worker doesn't report it and get a WCB report for it, and you, and you have some effects later, there's no worker's compensation. So there's the other problem, right, with this topic. So I'm not going to go through the entire list, but physiological, neurological, and physical symptoms. So loss of memory, PTS, those are and PTS, yes, from shock. You're afraid to get shocked again. In fact, if I was shocked, I would be afraid to get shocked again because the pain's significant. I haven't been shocked, but I know the pain is significant. All right. So long term sequela and sequelae, new information for you to consider. This topic is still evolving on electric shock and arc flash as far as electrical hazard identification and electrical hazard classification. Right. Some new information has come up with respect to high voltage capacitors or capacitors in general in the last three or four years from research done by the DOE. So you need to stay current on what's evolving. We haven't finished yet on, on our review of electric shock and arc flash. And like I said, specifically electrical hazard classification and this issue of sequela. Now, there has been research in Canada, the Sunnybrook Health and Science Center. They've researched this, they've got an electrical injury program, right? So Dr. Joel Fish, I did meet that gentleman years ago. And, and this was years ago, he did a presentation, but it, it went away because no one talked about it. It's currently Dr. Jeske now in Canada at Sunnybrook. That's the uh, physician in charge. So you can get more information from that website. And this one's going to surprise you because it surprised me. The University of Chicago has the CETRI program, the Chicago Electrical Trauma Research, uh, sorry, Rehabilitation Institute. So this is Dr. Lee and Dr. Pilskin. And you can go to that website and get tons of information on their research. And their website has a lot more technical content in digging into the detail of their research and how this current affects our body at the cellular level. And I'm not a doctor, so I'm not even going to start to quote any of the information, but it's very technical, very detailed. So their research has been ongoing, but really hasn't been published in the mainstream. At the IEEE Electrical Safety Workshop last year, Dr. Lee did come and present on CETRI and electric shock sequela. So I'm going to, in my effort to try and keep this, this topic current, continue to talk about electric shock immediate effects, but this electric shock sequela, new information for you. All right, so when is a worker exposed to arc flash? Same comment, work task. So what's their work task? We need the work task description first, and then that'll determine if the worker's interacting in a manner that they could create an abnormal arcing fault with their interaction. All right, now 70E and Z462 provide us with task tables in the last two editions. And their work task tables, there's about 31 work tasks generic, low and high voltage, AC and DC, so not all work tasks would apply to an employer and their employees or a workplace, but it starts with the work task, reference those task tables, interaction, highest related probability of occurrence, but we can get an abnormal working fault without interaction. It has happened. It does happen. Uh, I talk about likelihood of occurrence for either of these and their low likelihood already with this additional oversight. And if you apply this information and train your workers, and have it all you know, defined in an electrical safety program where you implement specific policies, practice and procedure requirements, so the likelihood even drives down even further, right? So abnormal equipment conditions, because we create it by removing a bolt on cover energized or open and hinged door, or for instance, water gets into the electrical equipment, right? Some form of contamination that can cause that abnormal arcing fault between conductors because we compromise that gap, right? The air gap is insulation. When we compromise it with us or something else, that can conduct and we get it too narrow and the voltage is high enough three phase, we can sustain an abnormal arcing fault, becomes an arc flash. All right, so voltage dependent. What's my work task? What's the maximum nominal voltage that I'll perform it at? And will that you know, be an electric shock hazard for me? In this case, sustain an abnormal arcing fault and arc flash. So here's a, just some excerpts of the tables just to show you. You can go to these tables in 70. I call these standards toolboxes. Take the tools out of the box, interpret them, don't accept them, interpret them, maybe modify them, and then train your workers on that specific information modification or your interpretation above and beyond any generic arc flash and shock training. All right, so great tools. Um, if you're not aware of them, take a look at them. This is really where this needs to start, right? 
work task-based electrical hazard identification, and then electrical hazard classification against, again, the different electrical equipment, and the different voltages um, that we have workers performing energized electrical work on. So you're going to go, well, Terry, we don't do energized work. Our policy is we don't work live. And I'm, I hear that often. I go, wait a minute. Are any of your workers doing any of these work tasks? Because if they are, and they're using, they're using one of these, right, then they're doing energized electrical work, right? So testing for absence of voltage is actually energized electrical work with an approved test instrument as well. So great resources. Again, great toolboxes, these two standards. So an abnormal arcing fault is a probabilistic event, right? And these are the volts of concern, 28 volt three phase from IEEE 1584. That's still the, quote, current documented research from a credible organization. And then for DC, they haven't formally studied that under IEEE 1584 yet, but other organizations have. And the one that I quote the most is the DOE in the US in their labs. And I'd say in the last oh, five to 10 years, they've started to share. They've started to share generic information that they can about electrical hazard classification. And for DC, it's nominal 125 volt DC UPS battery output or other significant DC power source. So large solar farms, if you weren't aware, they combine uh, the photovoltaic cells or panels into 1500 volt DC combiner boxes and then take the 1500 volts DC and, and invert it and step it up to high voltage distribution and transmission. So for DC, that's the nominal volts of concern, significant power source output, UPS batteries, or as I just mentioned, the solar. So we ionize air, and I'm going to show you a graphic here shortly, and the voltage has to be high enough, and it goes three phase, right, for AC, or DC, it's, it's only DC, you'd see one single, quote, well, you wouldn't even see the arc, it's going to convert to an arc flash fast, right, and then primarily it's this thermal energy release, this incident energy, so the arc flash, it's called incident energy, and then there's UVR light, uh, there's pressure. When we instantaneously get that abnormal arcing fault, it expands air, right? It does vaporize copper, but it's not the copper that's creating the pressure. It's the instantaneous expansion of air. We do get molten metal, of course. And then when we vaporize copper, it creates a toxic vapor, right? Or a smoke, right? So these are other abnormal conditions that can cause an abnormal arcing fault to occur. I've talked about interaction. Obviously, if the worker is not qualified or competent, they make a mistake or due to human error, fatigue being a, one of the top items probably on that list. And then that leads them to make an error. Condition of maintenance is something that does need to be assessed. And I recommend that we assess maintenance so the worker does in real time using look, listen, and smell. And I've got a video coming up on that topic too. So we don't operate equipment to its specifications. Obviously we get contamination and then rodents, very common problem, uh, or we over voltage uh, the equipment. We run it outside of those specifications and then the insulation gets compromised. So human interaction and other methods where we can get an abnormal arcing fault. So this is the definition of an arc flash in 70E and Z462. I like it again, a source of possible, possible injury, right? Release of energy caused by an electric arc. And I have quoted an abnormal electric arc, right? An abnormal electric arc. I've highlighted the notes and I've underlined a sentence that an arc flash incident is not likely to occur under normal operating conditions when enclosed equipment has been properly installed and maintained. And that's important for the discussion of not requiring arc flash PP to operate energized electrical equipment. Another sort of myth or, or I guess in industry, this, uh, this sort of thing, you know, this thing that's going on that an arc flash is going to be 100% likelihood and we just can't go in front of electrical equipment even to operate it. That's completely wrong. And your company, in my opinion, does a risk assessment and, and controls that narrative to the worker. It's quite important because arc flash over the years has taken on its own personality, as I said, and there's lots of myths and misinformation that aren't substantiated. So control the narrative, substantiate using risk assessment for the equipment that you work on, right? To operate it, we don't need arc flash and shock PP. When we open it up and go in, that's different. We're task dependent in that case, all right? So, and in the notes to the definition in 70 and Z462, it quotes to those, it quotes those task tables I mentioned. So the two task tables that you can reference for a list and it says likely of occurrence of, of basically an abnormal arcing fault as yes or no, based on condition of maintenance, right? And again, in some cases, normal and abnormal. And if we have normal operating or normal equipment conditions, we don't need arc flash PP. So here's the graphic, the visual. Again, we get that voltage three phase, right? We sustain uh, this arc when we compromise that gap and three phases interact instantaneously. And we get that arc flash. Got some videos coming up. And again, we can take a look at some arc flash arc flash and what actually occurs. 
So we, we have at the point of the arc, 35,000 degrees F, 20,000 20, degrees C. We don't see that. That's not the temperature that the worker's exposed to. It generates instant energy when we have that abnormal arcing fault. So the instant energy is in calories per centimeter squared. And 1.2 calories per centimeter squared is a very important value because that's the temperature that could burn skin exposed, right? And or ignite flammable clothing, cotton or cotton poly, 1.2 calories per centimeter squared. So that's instant energy. We get molten metal. Obviously, we get that instantaneous noise, the bang we hear, right? And then we get the toxic vapor. Uh, and again, there's multiple effects. Most PP protects for all of this, except for the blast pressure specifically. And you don't need any pressure related PPE for workers exposed to arc flash. Um, bomb squad techs, they wear pressure rated suits because they're right at the point where they may have a disruption and the pressure's right there. And that's a whole other topic. And, and when I talk about that, because electricians call them bomb suits, they're not bomb suits. And uh, if you want to you know, find out what a bomb suit looks like, um, watch the movie The Hurt Locker with Jeremy Reamer. Great movie for like military, but that's a bomb suit, right? So arc flash suits are not bomb suits, right? They're protecting from burn, right? And the molten metal accumulating on clothing and igniting, right? Okay, so the press, the arc blast pressure, just quick. So this is actually a graph from Dr. Ralph Lee's research. Dr. Ralph Lee was a PhD electrical engineer from Edmonton, Alberta, my home province. And uh, he did research in the late 1980s, theoretical, and actually came up with you know, theory and information that's still valid for blast pressure. It doesn't have any correlation to incident energy. There's what I call the 40 cal myth. This has been going on for a decade too. If the incident energy is 40 cals or greater, we can't do any work energized because the blast pressure is going to be extremely high. It was completely wrong, right? So his research back from 1980, 88, 89-ish, right, validated that. This is a graph. So we've got basically distance to the abnormal arcing fault the arcing fault current here, which will be lower than short circuit current, and then the theoretical pressure in pounds per square foot, right? So just a quick note on arc blast pressure, right? And the good thing is we've now started to add content to 70 and Z462 for the user to make sure that you understand the blast pressure is not what it was previously communicated. It is not going to be typically very significant on standard, you know, low voltage um, power distribution and branch circuit electrical equipment. So some videos, this one I'm showing to you because it's going to show you that we need uh, arc rated clothing on a worker if they're doing arc flash risk work because it won't ignite. In this case, it's a cotton shirt and the incident energy is greater than 1.2 calories. It's probably a 40 volt simulation of an arc flash and the clothing ignites. So I'll just play the video. So that's a cotton shirt that ignited and the burn injury would accelerate probably to third degree quite quickly uh, with the shirt burning on the worker. All right. So very important incident energy value, 1.2 calories. Now some additional videos. These are old security cam videos. Some of these are on the internet. And whenever I show this type of video, I, I have this question, was the risk level acceptable? We need to learn from these videos. They're unfortunate. Yes, workers were injured, but let's Let's learn from them. So this one's uh, 2003, which is important. There's three workers here. There's a worker on his back. There's no sound, right? So something happens. He's interacting in, and this is high voltage switch gear, outdoor, 13.8 gear. So he's in a cell that probably has low voltage in it. Somehow it creates an abnormal arcing fault. You see the arc flash. You saw the sort of the plasma, right? And then it went away quickly because it was cleared by an electrical protective device. The one gentleman came towards me. His clothing on fire. The gentleman with the heart out on still. His clothing's on fire. They're both in traumatic shock, right? Camera pans. And then the gentleman in the darker shirt that's clothing's not on fire, he starts to come out of traumatic shock, but he's still in traumatic shock because he starts to rip the clothing off that's burning and burns his hands probably, right, doing that. So second, third degree burns, they had hair nets on that were not arc rated at the time because they didn't exist because it's a food processing plant. You can now get arc rated beard nets and hair nets for industries that require it. So there was no identification of electrical hazards here. 2003, there was no PPE. The likelihood went up because there was two workers there confining the primary worker, talking and distracting him. And most likely one of them was his supervisor. And that increased right the likelihood because human performance and human error went up. Right. So again, that's the first video. This one's a commercial building. I think it's in Florida. Um, there's an electrical room here on the left. Right. 
so there's a primary worker in there doing some work, but he's got his guest with him. And, and the guest is wearing, okay, the guest is wearing uh, standard polyester shirt, runners, and, and uh, shorts. So he puts a glove on the ground, which is interesting because it's actually a rubber insulating glove. There's the guest. So when we do arc flasher shock risk work, there's no guests. There's no people there that shouldn't be there that are unqualified or unprotected. So there was no electrical hazard identification. Uh, it, it, the strange thing is it looks like he put a rubber insulating glove down on the floor, but the primary individual, the worker, didn't have any arc flash PP on. Now, this video is from the Middle East, and it's oil and gas. So they're wearing site standard PPE. Cover all hard hat, probably CSA approved, some, some, some approved footwear. So the worker's doing energized alteration in a motor control center to retrofit and wiring to get it to a new digital meter, right? So was the risk level acceptable? Well, no, because the worker didn't have any PP on for arc flash and shock. And there's, again, uh, this taller gentleman, this shorter gentleman back here that are right on top of them. They, they're, you know, they're, the companies didn't push them into the equipment. So I'll play the video, right? It's a lower instant energy arc flash because you'll see from that MCC starter bucket, you'll see a smaller sort of plasma ball come out and molten metal, and it goes away quickly because a protective device is clearing it. So that's why arc flash will be fast because we expect that the upstream electrical protect device will clear quickly if it's a branch circuit, slightly delayed if it's a main breaker that would see it. But if it's a branch circuit, it'll clear very quick. Now there's a fifth worker coming and it could walk in because there's no electrical work zone. Now I say fifth worker because believe it or not, Behind this control panel, there's a worker in blue coveralls leaning on the wall, which I don't even know why he's there. So here's the arc flash coming up, right? And then instantly the worker's exposed. Our brain's going to put us into, you know, traumatic shock. So you're you're out of it, right? And then thankfully it wasn't a significant arc flash because the other workers would have been burned too. So the other thing too is watch the gentleman in the in the in the golf shirt, um, sort of the green golf shirt. He's still looking inside the MCC, and there's a unbelievably a secondary abnormal arcing fault, right? So the thing is, any incident, get away from that scene because the hazard could still be there. In this case, it was. And then what do they do? They leave the incident scene unmanaged and walk away from it and someone could still come in. So there was no identification of arc flash or shock. There was no boundaries. There was no electrical work zone. There was no PP worn by the primary worker. And he was doing energized alteration, which we need to eliminate as a priority. Now, this one I call look, listen, and smell, or abnormal conditions on electrical equipment identified by what I'll call an operator. I'm just going to accelerate this. He comes in from the right, and there's a table there. Some work has been doing work left. He walks up, and he's going to hear something or smell something on this MCC in this starter bucket. Goes in once. Goes in twice. And then says, okay, I better find this worker. So he goes off to the right comes back, he walks in front of the MCC a third time, and then goes to find the worker with a roll-up door, has no success, comes back and says, I'm gonna check just one more time, right? So he had the opportunity immediately, the first time he detected an abnormal condition to not be there. This video is unbelievable because this is so unlikely. There's no interaction. There's been some sort of change in the electrical equipment, maybe the worker that was working in it that caused that abnormal arcing fault and arc flash to occur. Now, a main breaker opened because it totally blacked out the electrical room. So again, arc flashes will be pretty fast, extremely fast relative, and then go away. But it's that instantaneous exposure that'll cause the burn injury. And I don't know, you know what the burn injury was on that individual. Now, in this case, this video is coal-infused arc flash shoot from a coal-fired power plant. Transalta, who gave me the video, allows me to use it. And, and so what we were trying to see is if the coal dust would cause a, you know, a degradation performance of the arc flash shoot. So we're looking for sustained after burn, after flaming on the garment. So 1001, 1002, 1003, 1004, 1005. So that's acceptable where it self extinguished. So flame resistant fabric that's arc weighted will self extinguish if it does ignite like that. So we think it flashed off the coal dust. Now that's not a normal arc flash. This is at the Kinetrix lab in Mississauga where a, a lot of the arc flash PP testing is completed for North America and they're, they're limited on their fault current. So they had to hold that closed for two seconds to get 100 cals of instant energy. So that's not going to be a normal arc flash. We see it sustained like that 
for two seconds. It's the other videos where it, it's, it happens and, and, it, and it goes away very quickly. So just briefly, you know, OSHA in, in the US and OHS in Canada, there hasn't been much change here, right? And, and I always quote, they have general duty clauses that these hazards should be, you know, identified. Uh, and then the employer needs to implement, you know, controls, eliminate exposure or implement other controls to reduce risk. So OSHA does have specific language aligned with 70 that hasn't changed. And in Canada, provincially, territorially, or federally, it's mostly the provinces and territories that have specific language because they're independent in OHS regulations. And I just quote British Columbia Part 19 as an example, and it's electrical safety. So I do have just, you know, go to the internet, check OSHA's website. They have electrical safety content. And I found this page where they do indicate that their documentation, they're really referencing the National Electrical Code and NFPA 70E. They haven't formally adopted 70E into OSHA law, but their language, their documentation, their, their regulations really align with it if you read through the lines, right? And then in Canada, federally, we've got the Canada Labor Code Part 2, which is very high level. It only has general duty. The electrical safety section is quite outdated uh, in Canada's federal laws. And then BC, British Columbia, uh, on the West Coast in Canada, it has some of the most detailed electrical safety regulations in Canada, and it defines it by low and high voltage. And then electrical has identification and responsibility of the worker. But it does say if we, if, if we can't disconnect, then apply PPE, but the employer needs to determine PPE. So again, in Canada, slightly different than the states. Incidents, so electrical incidents, this is a report available on the internet from the National Fire Protection Research Foundation through NFPA and UL and published in 2015. So they quote 5,587 fatalities in 20 years, 99% were electrocutions, only 1% were fatalities due to burns. And most recently I contacted Electrical Safety Federation International, their more current research. And they said from 2011 to 2021, we only had 16 fatalities due to arc flash. So this helps us establish the context. It doesn't mean that arc flashes aren't occurring. They are, but they're resulting in burns and most likely curable burns. Whereas the electric shocks, we still don't have those reported. All we see is the electrocutions because those, those will be reported. The evolution of 70 and Z462 in the last five editions, initially just said get on PP, you know, in the 08 or the 09 and 012, and they changed to hazard identification and risk assessment in the last three editions, and that will be sustained going forward. So standard sort of general information in these documents, paraphrasing what's there, definitions, general requirements, establishing elective safe work condition, turn it off, lock out, tag out, work involving electrical hazards. There's some high level information on electrical equipment maintenance, but I recommend in the US that you reference NFPA 70B, and in Canada that you reference CSA Z463. There's some special equipment in 70 and Z462, and then there's annexes of supporting information and in support of the articles or clauses. So just paraphrasing the requirements, an electrical safety program is mandatory. And that electrical safety program should have a mandatory risk assessment procedure. And I recommend work task-based because 70E and Z462 are work task-based. We need to understand normal operating or normal equipment conditions. And the worker needs to document their arc flash and shock risk assessments. And I call it an energized electrical job safety planning form. There's examples of those in Annex I. Qualified person, that information didn't change. And again, there's some trade training. And then you have, in addition to that, electrical safety training. And then 70 and Z46 to identify that training with a three-year frequency. The risk assessment procedure, simple three-by-three three electrical hazard risk matrix example. I recommend a qualitative work task-based risk assessment. And it's three steps. Work task has identification electrical identification, analyze potential severity of injured damage to health and like recurrence, and then determine the hierarchy of risk controls that you need to deal with the potential effects of electric shock or arc flash immediate, right? So again, that's the simple three-step risk assessment procedure, and it doesn't have to be overly complicated, but the employer is supposed to complete that against work tasks. This is the six hierarchy of risk controls. Elimination is the first one. Substitution and engineering safety by design really have to be completed by the electrical equipment owner, right? Or the company that specifies that electrical equipment. Warning signs and barricading, applying training and using procedures to achieve residual risk level reduction. And then the PPE is last, all right? So six controls and we want risk as low as reasonably practicable. 
training every three years, de-energizing is a priority. That's quite clear in 70 and Z462, and I promote that. But we need to sort this out because I'm, well, Terry, we can't do any energized work. Well, 70 and Z462 don't say that. We want to eliminate the repair and alteration and do justified diagnostics and isolation-related work tasks, and we need to operate energized electrical equipment to, again, further you know, assess the worker's exposure related to the work task inventory that you create. We have the shock risk assessment and the arc flash risk assessment to get boundaries and the PPE. So we've got two shock protection approach boundaries, limited and restricted, and one arc flash boundary. And again, this graphic I use is just simply to communicate these boundaries are used to control keeping unqualified, unprotected workers out. The workers that qualified and authorized that's in them has on arc flash and shock PP. So there's different rules and policies and controls that are required depending on which boundary is breached. All right. With respect to the arc flash PP, there's two methods to determine the PP and the arc flash boundary identified in 70 and Z462 incident energy analysis by a PNG or PA. E electrical engineer with a report provided to the equipment owner and install equipment labels. These are compliant equipment labels that you see on the screen, which I could explain in more detail if you are interested, um, but they're compliant labels. And that the problem is from these studies, there's lots of non-compliant labels out there that aren't helping the worker. They're confusing the worker. So instant energy and labels or the arc flash PP category method or what's quoted as the table method for AC electrical equipment and DC electrical equipment meant to be far simpler to use if we don't have incident energy analysis studies, all right? So, and what we're determining is arc flash PP with an arc thermal performance value, not an HRC2 or a category number or a level A, B, C, D, E. That's completely wrong, right? Arc rated clothing is specified, ordered by the employer with an arc thermal performance value. And the worker identifies the arc thermal performance value they need. They need and there's two arc rated levels defined in 70 and Z462, 1.2 to 12 cal, everyday task wear or greater than 12, which will be an arc flash suit. All right. So this is another infographic where I show you an image, right, of everyday task wear coverall, shield and balaclava versus an arc flash suit and two arc rated clothing levels, full body protection, top of your head to your fingertips, to your toes when you're exposed to arc flash. For shock, it's very simple. For shock, it's these rubber insulating gloves with leather protectors. This is it because I told you it's the hands going in. So your hand goes in this or this. This, no shock, this, shock. So we need the right class and we need the right leather protector and size. We need these dielectric tested, right? And then the worker needs to wear them. <laughs> That's the key, they gotta put them on, right? And we have to deal with any discomfort issues that they may claim, right? Again, they're not meant to be doing fine work. They're meant to be holding, right? The probes on your test instrument. When you go in and then no invert movement because I'm going in bare hand, right? Or with the glove now. So this is it for shock. Get these gloves. If your workers are doing energized work and their hands go inside a box with again, electrical equipment, 120 volt AC single phase or higher, and then invert movement, they won't get shocked. So operating electrical equipment, just some pictures here. So under normal equipment conditions, the worker that's authorized, right? Can operate the equipment procedurally, stand to the side, look away, might want to hold your breath, then switch it and you're done, right? Open or close that. You can read an HMI or display. You don't need arc flash PP. We need to get beyond some of these myths. So level one arc flash PP is exactly what I just showed you sort of graphically. You can see on the left, it's an MCC starter bucket, arc rated face shield, balaclava, ear canal insert earplugs. You need clear uh, approved safety eyewear underneath because all those, the shield is pretty significant polycarbonate, right? It's just not rated, right? It's just not rated um, or tested by the manufacturer to give it the appropriate approvals, right? And then the arc rated clothing, rubber insulating gloves with leather protectors provide arc flash protection for the hands, but will not have an ETPV. Vendors have tested these. This class zero could be up to good to 40 calories. And that's before just the rubber would melt. So significant protection. And I recommend if you're not exposed to shock and only arc flash, you wear the right class of rubber insulating gloves. So just another example picture, um, worker doing diagnostics on a motor control center starter bucket. A couple of workers Prius inspecting and donning the PP. Yes, that's actually me if you look close. <laughs> so you got to Prius inspect all of it, don it, and put it on. And then these are arc flash suits. Again, that's me on the right as the actor, right? So these are obviously a little more um, and a little more you know significant, but the technology has changed on these suits. They've just continued to go down 
in, in weight, fabric weight, therefore weight to the worker. And just a couple example pictures again, racking out a low voltage power circuit breaker with an electrical work zone, racking out or in a high voltage power circuit breaker on the right with an electrical work zone. For these work tasks, we want the electrical safety watch. Workers do not need a safety watch for standard work tasks. They can work alone following your company's policies and procedures, right? For voltage testing, current measurements, standard diagnostics. The rubber insulating gloves, as I pointed out, right? We need to get those on a worker, right? If their shock risk assessment indicates that they have identified what's called the restricted approach boundary. And once you have that restricted approach boundary, which is 12 inches for low voltage electrical equipment, and that's your hands go in the box, then these would be worn by policy, right? By policy. Insulated hand tools required. If I do have to do energized repair and alteration, one, I would need an energized electrical work permit, right? And again, I'm just advising you look to 70 and Z462 for the permit, but there's exemptions, but there would be no exemptions for repair and alteration, and you would need insulated hand tools. And approved test instruments. So we want approved test instrument to be used, the right category, the right rating, right? When the worker has to use these test instruments to go in and do diagnostics and troubleshooting, right? Readily available, multiple manufacturers out there, right? That'll be the right category, right? So the category is an over transient rating. So for power measurements, we want minimum cat three, right? And then that'll be rated for a higher over transient voltage that the device won't disrupt if there happens to be a spike, you know, while the worker's using it. And I had to say, you know, we need to make sure we got GFCIs out there. There's some portable inline examples on the screen. So Again, workers that use portable cord and plug connect electrical equipment extension cords, wet indoor outdoor work, we need them to plug in a GFCI. But first of all, they've got to inspect that PP to make sure it's in a normal condition and no electrician's tape if it's damaged. Tag it and bag it, give it to the supervisor. So again, I, I again electrical safety basis, dark flash and shock, and I've tried to get through this uh, within a reasonable speed so I can open up questions and we can have some time for that. Um, so closing remarks. Electrical hazards need to be identified, but it's work task based, right? So it's it's about the work task first, then what's the maximum nominal voltage as I was indicating? And then is it high enough that I can get shocked or sustain an abnormal arcing fault? And then we use shock risk assessment and arc flash risk assessment procedures in 70 and Z462 to get the boundaries and determine when we need the PPE. Eliminating the arc flash and electric shock hazards is a priority, all right? So we wanna make sure that that is at the top of the list. So the impact can be significant. The immediate effects, right? Where it could be, you know, immediately I, I just pull my hands out. I just felt the pain. But as I said, for shock, right? Electrocution is, and really I say two things, you're either gonna survive the shock or you're not, right? And then this new sequela that I've mentioned is something new that just, you know, pay attention to that and maybe follow up and download some of that information and check the Sunnybrook website and the Setri website for more information. So the, the OHS regulations, they do require training to be provided and they do require the employer to identify these two hazards and either eliminate exposure or apply controls. They haven't adopted 70 and Z462 into OHS law yet, but they both the US and in Canada, the regulator really says you may wanna look at these standards. And there, here's the other thing, benchmarking, pretty well, you can't get away from that. You can't say, well, no one else is using these standards. No, that's that's eons ago that you couldn't say that. So when you benchmark against industry, industry is using these standards to, again, identify uh, the hazards and implement controls and policies, practices, and generic procedure requirements. All right, so due diligence, I've got those words on the screen. So that's the other aspect of this. 70 and Z462 are your due diligence toolboxes. So if you aren't using them, you need to. If you are, you need to continually you know, stay up to speed on what's happening with these standards. 70 2024 comes out September this year. Z462 2024 comes out January 2024. There will be significant changes in CSA Z462, but less changes in 70E, uh, these two additions, these new additions coming up. All right, so we've adopted um, 70E in, in Canada as Z462. And I have to quote really, What's missing is employers need to get electrical safety programs developed. You need to control this. You need to control how these standards are interpreted and used and control how the training is applied. So that overarching risk assess procedure, qualitative work task based, again, I, 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 I totally recommend it. I sponsor it. That's what you need to do to get control of this. Elimination is the highest priority. Apply those six hierarchy of risk control methods. 
the two tools for the worker. These are tools for the worker. The worker completes the shock risk assessment. The worker completes the arc flash risk assessment and they document it. We need them to take more ownership. We need them to take control for any workplace hazard. You help them, give them the tools, then they apply it in the field. So we want them to own identification of these hazards, apply the boundaries, select the PP, and use other higher care risk control methods that you provided them to minimize their risk, reduce it to as low as reasonably practical. Training is required, as I said, and, I, and my, my opinion is the regulator would expect that our flash and shock training has been provided, and you need to manage that and really a three-year frequency, which really cycles with the three-year cycle of 70E and Z462 and the arc flash and shock PP. I just highlighted it briefly and, and again, this webinar today, but there's a lot more detail that you need to, uh, to get involved with, with respect to your specification, your procurement, your inventory management, the dielectric retesting of appropriate shock PP, and then getting the worker to make sure they do their pre-use specs, pre-use pre inspections and checks right before they use it, and then inventory management and laundering. Uh, I didn't mention that, laundering. I'm finding in the last little while that I, I asked, well, how are you laundering this arc flash PP? Well, we're getting the workers to launder at home. And I said, did you give them laundering instructions? So manage how you get this PP laundered, either at the workplace, at home, or using an industrial launder, and make sure you follow up and that the PP is being laundered correctly. Here's the golden rule, no fabric softs or bleaches, right, used when you launder the arc rated clothing. All right, so I, I tried to get through this as quick as possible. I wanted to allow more time for Q&A, right? So Sam, I'm just gonna sort of rely on you and I'll maybe open up the Q&A dialogue if there's some questions that have come in uh, and we can deal with any questions and hopefully have uh, a bit of a session here. Awesome, great. Okay, um, so anyone out in the audience, if you have a question, feel free to click that Q&A button and submit and we'll get to it. Uh, the first question I have is, is arc flash only possible on three phase or can it happen on single phase systems? So that's a really good question. And IEEE 1584, the 2018 edition, uh, it's really the, the, the key standard for us, North America why, and actually internationally. And it's two eight volt three phase that, that they have established as the, as, the, as the lowest voltage and three phase interaction. So we'll, we might get a single phase arc flash in that three phase electrical coil, but it's instantaneously going to go all three phases. So if we have 120 volt single phase electrical equipment, it's not going to create an arc flash. You'll get an abnormal arcing fault, the screwdriver and a panel board that the electricians created and because they didn't wrap up the shaft, right? And then for 240 volt single phase right now can't be sustained, but we're going to start to see some debate about these higher, like 240 specifically, right? Uh, 120, 240 volt single phase panel boards. And so you're probably starting to hear some information or see some posts on our different social media uh, software platforms, right? And it's not substantiated. In CSA Z462, we unfortunately included in a new alternate table to the arc flash PP category tables. And this information is not in 70 that says 240 volt single phase, but I didn't vote to accept it because it wasn't substantiated. So it's a bit of a convoluted answer, but my answer is right now, 120, 240 volt single phase, abnormal arcing fault only, can't sustain and become an arc flash. But you know you need to stay you know, informed and, and, and watch what's gonna happen here with more work on electrical hazard classification and research in the next you know, one to three to five to 10 years. Okay, thank you so much, Terry. Uh, so next question I have, do rubber insulating gloves, gloves require testing? Excuse me. So I mentioned that that we need dielectric testing of shock PP and the rubber insulating gloves and, and these gloves, they need to be tested and have a test date on them here that would indicate in the last six months. So it's American Society of Test Material Standards that indicate that we need these gloves dielectric tested every six months. So, and what happens, I, I'm, I'm out on a, a site and I look at the gloves and I said, they're not tested every six months. You've got to set up a PM and regularly get these out to an approved lab that can do the tests to meet ASTM requirements. So the gloves have to be tested, live line tools, hot sticks every 24 months and temper protector grounds every 36. Now that's non-utility application of the hot sticks and the grounds. Electric utilities will test the rubber insulating gloves, hot sticks and grounds more frequently because their power line technicians are using them daily, weekly. So the, the more frequently you use the shock PP, right? Then you might want to decrease an established policy 
of a minimum six month testing for the rubber insulating gloves. Thank you. Uh, so uh, the last question I have is, do all workers on a work site require an arc flash PPE? So uh, no, <laughs> there's the blunt answer. And, 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 and you know, I, I, I manage this topic from the standpoint of, I want the workers that need the protection to have it, but unfortunately we still have to look at, at financial issues. So safety is priority one. And if, if it's appropriate, yeah, we'll, we'll spend the money, but you know, we've got, you know, non-electrical worker staff, um, we've got operators and they don't need our created clothing because they're not exposed to arc flash. Now, some employers are putting, you know, everyday task wear arc created clothing on what I'll call an operator, and but they don't do and should not be exposed to arc flash. So not all workers on a work site need everyday task wear arc created clothing that they wear just as a normal daily uniform, right? You, you, you got to manage this because unfortunately, I just got to say, you got, you still have to manage budget. So we want to make sure we do, a, you know, appropriate electrical hazard identification for electric shock and arc flash. And we get the PP for the right workers that need it. And I, I use the phrase qualified electrical worker, task qualified worker, qualified uh, instrumentation worker, qualified operations worker, and a non-electrical worker. Task qualified worker would be the, the HVAC or AC refrigerator tech. So just FYI, I call that a task qualified worker, but that's also a overhead door crane mechanic, a cloud protection technician, uh, elevator mechanic, a fire alarm tech, right? So the primary qualified electrical worker is a, a journey person electrician, or let's say a power line technician. So, but you've got to do this inventory of your worker roles at your work site, what workers are exposed, and that we want to put them in this everyday task where as a uniform. And then all they have to do, as you can see in the picture, decide if they need a balaclava and a shield next and hand protection. So no, not all workers on a work site need everyday task wear arc flash PP and then separately procure arc flash suits, right? For the qualified electrical workers. So I have another question that has popped in that we have time for. Why are rules for three foot distance from HVAC equipment not adhered to in build and design of structures? So I'm wondering where that one's coming from, right? So this three foot distance, so I, I see the question coming in and, and I'm going to separate this three foot distance because I'm not sure what the context is. So what I'm going to answer is for, for electric shock, we apply shock protection approach boundaries, right? And they're limited and restricted. So the limited approach boundary is 42 inches, restricted is 12, right? And limited approach, if I go inside the 42 and I don't breach the 12, I don't need shock PP. It's only if I go inside restricted approach for shock that I need shock PPE. The arc flash boundary is a separate distance and it's a variable distance depending again on the electrical equipment parameters. So that's a variable distance. And then there's a, an, another, another, another distance for arc flash called the working distance. And the working distance is really the distance from where the abnormal arcing fault would occur to the worker's face and torso. So I'm a bit confused about the three foot distance that's being sort of called up in the question, right? Um, again, that might be a spacing issue, you know, in front of that equipment, uh, which would be more maybe uh, like a national electrical code workspace issue, right? I'm not just sure of the context. So I hope I've given some additional context to this question about three foot, right? So I'm not sure if that's, again, a national electrical code issue or if something unique to building code. Um, again, I just, lots of information to know. So I'm just giving you sort of the question I can and quick response to that question. Sam, anything okay. else? Uh, I think that is all for the Q&A session. Terry, thank you so much for coming on, being informative and, and taking time to answer all these questions. So um, everyone, we have CX Energy coming up in May and ABC every year has a test and balance seminar for CXAs, engineers and tab professionals. And let me tell you last year, it was absolutely packed. So we're increasing the room size. We're ready for you. If you want to register and look at the schedule that we have lined up, just visit um, abc.com or cxenergy.com and then use tab 10 to get that 10% discount in case you're looking for a little discount there. We do have more webinars coming up in 2023. So please make sure to check your emails. We'll be sending you information about the next one today, actually. So have a wonderful 
uh, rest of your day, and we will see you in February. Thank you, ABBC, Thank you, everyone. Thank you everyone for attending today. Have a great day and a great rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Bye, everyone.